The scripture reading for this morning, as you see in your bulletins, is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 8 through 11, and I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which is what's in our pews. I want to set the scene, however, before I read the scripture to give you the context. It was the last night of Jesus' earthly life, the day that we, the evening that we commemorate as Maundy Thursday or Holy Thursday. Jesus gathered with his closest friends and followers in the upper room to share one final meal and to have one more opportunity, one last opportunity to teach his disciples before he would soon be arrested and tortured and hung on the cross of Calvary to die. It was this evening, John chapter 14 begins with those beloved words of assurance and comfort and strength. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you. You know that passage, it is so familiar, so beloved. It's in this same setting, very shortly after this, the next verses, starting with verse 8. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, for those who have been able to be here in worship or listen over the radio the past couple of weeks, you know that our Advent sermon series is based on the words of the prophet Isaiah, who lived about 700 years before Christ. Within his prophecy regarding the promised Messiah who was to come, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A very quick review for those of you who maybe weren't here the last two weeks. The first Sunday of Advent, we considered Jesus as Wonderful Counselor, always available to us, the personification of divine wisdom, and continually providing us with hope. Wonderful Counselor. The second Sunday, which was last week, we contemplated Jesus being mighty God, and we focused on the angel Gabriel's message to the young girl Mary. This is from Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26, when the angel Gabriel said to Mary, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And the angel continued, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The angel Gabriel was describing what we call the incarnation, the enfleshment or the embodiment of God. The Gospel of John, the first chapter, tells us the same thing. And the Word of God, the Word of God who is Jesus, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. Yes, in addition to being wonderful counselor, the child born to us, the son given to us, is mighty God. And now, the third week of Advent, what does it mean when the prophet Isaiah called Messiah 
everlasting father. Quite a dramatic name for a newborn baby, huh? And scholars agree that this title is intriguing. Of all the titles given to the Christ child, this one probably raises the most questions. And so let's break it down into two parts and start first by considering the name or the title Father. Father. Now you may be thinking, we all know what a father is, so let's move on. But there's a particular distinction that comes out of this name, this title, especially when we pause to consider what the people of Isaiah's day associated with the title and the position of father. And we discover what it meant to them, what father meant to them, by looking at the other side of it and examining what it meant to them to be fatherless. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, beginning verse 17, I read, this is the word of the Lord, laws that he was giving to his people. Do not deprive the alien, and that means foreigner who is living among you. Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from the trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That's why I command you to do this. Wow, from this passage of scripture and several other passages within God's word, we learn that the fatherless were those who were without provision and without protection. And so we see that to Isaiah's first hearers centuries ago, a father was one who provided for and protected his family, not unlike today. Now, interestingly, up to this point in Isaiah's day, only God the Creator could be referred to as Father. Example, Psalm 89, verse 26. You are my Father, my God, my Rock and Savior. Psalm 68, verses 4 and 5. Sing to God, sing praise to his name, exalt him who rides on the clouds, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. And yet Isaiah prophesied that the child to be born, the son to be given, would be called everlasting father. When Jesus had grown to an adult, he himself declared, this is in John 10, verse 30, Jesus himself declared, I and the father are one. In John 14, 9, we heard, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus proclaimed. And how true this was, because remember from last week, Jesus was God in human flesh. So Jesus is saying, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The word of God became flesh and lived among us. Now admittedly, this is difficult, if not impossible, for us to comprehend and yet it is a, a very basic principle of scripture, a basic doctrine of scripture. It's the very foundation of our Christian faith that the Lord God, our Father, took on human flesh and lived among us. Father, the provider, the protector. Next, what does it mean to say Jesus is everlasting? Father. Well, we also know what the word everlasting means. It means eternal, perpetual, permanent, without beginning, without end, 
everlasting. And to say that Jesus is everlasting Father is to proclaim that Jesus always was and is and forever will be. In the beginning, Jesus was. Throughout all time, Jesus is. There was never a time that Jesus was not. In the Revelation, chapter 1, verse 8, we read, these are the words of the risen Christ, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And the awesome reality, the great mystery of our faith, is that in the incarnation, the everlasting one, the timeless one, entered into time and made himself subject to time. The everlasting one voluntarily took on human flesh to come and live among us. He submitted himself to be bound by chronological time, the everlasting one. Luke chapter 2 verse 40 tells us that Jesus experienced growth over time. When he was a baby and a toddler, he experienced growth over time. The Bible tells us he grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. And he went on to procure our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins through his death on the cross of Calvary, becoming the bridge to our being able to have a personal relationship with God, our creator. And Jesus arose from the grave on that third day. He ascended then into heaven, from which he will someday return to claim all who believe in him. Everlasting Father, indeed. Continuing everlastingly in his deep love for us, in his care for us, in his protection of us and in his provision for us. One Bible commentary asked this question, doesn't this title of everlasting father, even more than the others, bring comfort to our hearts? For we can now and forever still run to Jesus, our everlasting father. Not only will he never leave us or forsake us, he also loves us beyond our imagination. He protects us throughout whatever may come, and he provides for us for all of our needs. He gives us life, abundant and eternal. All of the good things Jesus is to us now, he will always be to us. He will always be our provider and our protector and our savior. He will always be our refuge and our strength. His love for us will never cease, either in this world or in the world to come. In him, we will have eternal joy and hope and glory and pleasure. In Christ, we will be eternally blessed and secure. We will experience his peace which will lead us to next week when we consider Jesus as Prince of Peace. Because Jesus is our wonderful counselor, we can seek him and find him. Because Jesus is our mighty God, we can rest in his all-powerful care. Because Jesus is everlasting Father, we can run to him and find home. Friends, if you haven't yet, will you run to Jesus today? Will you take a step of faith and pray to him? Will you ask him to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse your soul, to give you a, a brand new start and to come into your heart that he might be your leader, the Lord of your life? Sisters and brothers, nobody knows you like Jesus does. And nobody loves you like Jesus does. What 
problems fill your life today? What mountains are ahead of you? What storms are battering your heart? What sorrows fill your life today? Will you turn them all over to Jesus? He will hear your prayer. He will come into your life. He will do his good work within you. Will you pray to Jesus, our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father? You know, I've been thinking, there's no better time than Christmas to meet the one whom the season is really all about. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being a father forever to us. We thank you for hearing the cries of our hearts. We thank you for knowing the burdens that we carry, the sorrows, the fears. We thank you that you know it all. And Lord, as you know our need, we pray that you will continue to draw us to you in prayer, that you will continue to accept us in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you are all, always more ready to hear and to receive than we are ready to pray and to turn to you, to run to you. And so, Lord, we pray that you will hear our prayers, that you will forgive us of our sins, that you will wash us clean, that you'll give us a fresh start in your power and in your love. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will come into our hearts, that you will take control and work your work for good, for our own good and to the greatest glory of your holy name. And, O oh Lord, may it be that we might know and experience the tenderness of your unfailing love that we might experience it in new ways this Christmas season. May it be, for we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>